Uh, good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see. I think almost everybody was at the long meditation yesterday. So it's great that we're all here this morning, and it feels like the bliss of that is continuing on. So um, my name is Bhagavati, <laughs> and this is my husband, Ramesha, for anybody who doesn't already know us. And the reading today, I will read from Rays of the One Light, Weekly Commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. This week's topic is the Divine Ascension. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, we read, I am the way, the truth, and the life. life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What is this I when spoken by a master who has conquered every vestige of ego consciousness? Therein lies the mystery of true scriptural teaching. That I that is no I. Does it even exist? In what way is it different from the consciousness that animates other human beings? Jesus was not saying, look at me, don't look at other masters. He was saying, rather, look at the divine self that is the essence of who you are, your very self, with a capital S. You are that I. No man cometh unto the divine consciousness except by first recognizing his own intrinsic divinity, hidden behind his delusive ego. The Bhagavad Gita in the fourth chapter states, O son of Pritha, Arjuna, in whatever way people accept me, in that same way do I appear to them. For all men, in some way, pursue the path to me. Meditate on the divine incarnations, their lives, and the consciousness animating them will be your stairway to the infinite. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. I would like to start by reading um, from Whispers from Eternity, Prayers and Prayers Demands by Paramhansa Yogananda. This is called, uh, Make Me Anything, a Christian or a Hindu, Anything to Realize Thee. Let me be Christian, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, Mohammedan, or Sufi. I care not what my religion, my race, my creed, or my color be, if only I can win my way to thee. But let me be none of these if it it enmesh me in labyrinthine ways of religious formalities. Let me travel the royal road of realization which leads to thee. I care not what bypaths of religion I follow if at last I can travel by the one highway of common realization, which straightway leads to thee. Send the sunshine of thy wisdom to guide me in the daylight of my dawning powers and the moon of thy mercy if I travel in the dark night of sorrow. So, um, the other day, when I started to finally work on my talk um, for today, I I wanted to find. I kn- I knew that Yogananda, in his for those of you who don't know, Paramahansa Yogananda, uh, in wrote an interpretation of all the Gospels, and but I I didn't have the books with me, and I knew that he, of course, must have interpreted this passage, and I remember reading about it. You know, the passage that Bhagavati just read, I am the way, uh, 
what is it? the truth and the light, life. And, um, and so I, I Googled it. And sure enough, I found it. I found a, it was like a biblical kind of forum with a bunch of different comments on that passage. And so I read Yogananda's interpretation, and I will tell you a little about, about it a little later. But then right under Yogananda's interpretation was this other guy who wrote, there, there is the proof that the Christian religion is the only true religion, right then and there. And it was so funny, the contrast between the two. And I thought, oh, God. And I looked down, and pretty much almost everybody else had the same take on it. And, um, <laughs> you know, you can't really blame them. I mean, if you read it just, and just use your brain, well, it's very tempting, especially if you're a Christian, of course. <laughs> it's very tempting to uh, understand that, you know, Christ was the only way. And, you know, if, if you don't have any knowledge of deeper realities, deeper teachings... That's pretty much what I think I would interpret it, honestly. I grew up Catholic, and when I first read Yogananda's interpretation of that passage, it was like, um, okay, uh, <laughs> that's a little complicated. Uh, I, honestly, it, it seemed like he was just trying to avoid it, you know. And, but anyway, it, of course, there's more to it than just the words. But... Um, I, I want to tell you a little story, speaking of, um, like I said, I grew up Catholic in southern Switzerland, so there's not much else that you can choose besides being a Catholic, <laughs> even if you wanted to. And um, I remember I was about, I think I was 11 or 12, I don't remember. But um, I had started to take um, yoga classes with my mom when I was seven, and not because I chose to, but just because she wanted to take yoga classes and she suffered from depression so she wanted me to drive with her she was afraid of driving alone and so I went with her and for this reason I got into yoga and I started reading a few things we became good friends with the yoga teacher and all that so and I, I was good friends with a family in the village where I grew up it was a family of uh, of course father mother and five daughters there were all five daughters and they were all very, very Catholic, very devoted. They were going to the Mass every Sunday and all that, doing prayers together. It was very sweet. And so, and they knew that I was interested in yoga. And so one day, they took me to a certain convent. They, they wanted to go visit this convent. And I said, oh, sure, let's go. And I didn't know that they had a hidden plan for me. <laughs> And so when we got there, they had me meet with a priest. And uh, this priest was confessing people, so I decided to, oh, they were all confessing, okay. So I went, it was my turn to go in and talk to this priest. And, and so, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the Catholic way of confessing, <laughs> but you just, you know, kneel down and, you know, sign, what's the way? The the, do the sign of the cross, and then you start telling him about your stuff. And, uh, and I started like that. And then he stopped me and started saying, you know, um, we have to be very careful when we, do, when we practice yoga because it can easily become a religion. And you don't really want to lose your religion. And I started looking at him like, uh, <laughs> what is this going? And he went on and on and on. And finally, I remember, I got up, I said, I'm sorry, I'm just not interested in what you have to say. And I walked out. <laughs> and I said to my friends, I want to go home. <laughs> and that was it. I just felt, even though I wasn't meditating yet, I, wasn't, I hadn't read anything about Yogananda, but it just felt so wrong to me to have that narrow-minded of an approach to truth. It just didn't feel right. So I'll never forget that. I, st I can still see the guy sitting there telling me about this stuff. Anyway. Um, but your soul feels that there's something. You know, when, when somebody is being so uh, dogmatic about things, there is something inside us that feels uncomfortable. We don't quite know what it is, maybe, if we're not 
used to recognizing it, but there is something that is just not comfortable and it doesn't feel right. And so that's probably what I was tuning into. I, I would like to elaborate a little bit on what um, Swamiji says in the passage. So, okay, what is the interpretation that Yogananda gave of the passage? I am, I am the truth, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody goes through to the Father but through me. Something like that. <laughs> um, so, um, wh- when somebody like Jesus says, I, you know, I was thinking about it. When I, what do I mean when I say I? If I say I'm cold or I'm hungry, what do I really mean? You know, if you think about it, most of the times when we say I, we actually talk about, we're talking about our bodies. And are we the body? No. We know that. I mean, if we know, do you think Jesus Christ didn't know? I mean, I'm pretty sure that he was pretty clear about that. And so when somebody like Jesus says, I, we have to really think about what he means. Um, Jesus, who was Jesus? Jesus was a perfect soul. He had realized, realized his total and complete and perfect oneness with the Father. There was nothing left of the man. Nothing. No ego, no personality. I mean, he had to use a personality, of course, but he wasn't that. And so, when somebody like Jesus says, I, there is way more to it. And he, Jesus Christ, represented the Christ consciousness. The Christ consciousness is God manifest in creation. So he had, Jesus Christ had realized his oneness with everything, with all that exists. And when he said, nobody goes to the Father but through me, he meant that you cannot go to God the Father beyond creation if you don't first realize that you're one with God in creation. So there's, those are two different stages of realization. First, you merge into, um, into God in creation and you become a Christ-like soul. Yogananda said that in order to be called a master, you have to have reached Christ consciousness. So it means that you're, you, you have realized in your meditation that you are one with everything. So whatever happens on any planet, in any galaxy, you are aware of. That's pretty pretty awesome, isn't it? Um, So after you've realized that oneness with the whole creation, only then can you, by going even deeper, can you realize that you're one with God also beyond creation, which means God is both in creation and it's also beyond creation. God is manifest as well as unmanifested. And so these are, it, it's very deep and very hard to grasp when we're still struggling with, you know, calming down when we meditate and not thinking about things. But that's where we're all uh, uh, directed, bound to, uh, that's our direction. and. Um, That's what we're trying to do in our meditations. Um, Also, if you think about it, there are, when Jesus came, he was talking to people who were very, very uh, meticulously following the law, you know, the law of Moses. It was a long list of things that you were supposed to do and a long list of things that you were not supposed to do. One of which was you, you are supposed... I'm just mentioning one from the Bible that uh, the Pharisees were uh, scolding Jesus' disciples because they didn't wash their hands before their meals. Now, we you know that this is a very good thing to do, but it was just because that, that was the law. And if you don't do it, it's very bad. But you know, it, and Jesus had to point out many times, you know, these are really small things. You know, there are much more important things that would be good to follow and, and think about. And so 
uh, Jesus brought a new concept. He brought grace. He brought love. He taught people that love transcends the law. Love is superior to any formalities, any little rule that you need to follow. And when we, when we get on the spiritual path, we learn that there's something called karma, and that one of the purposes of being on the path, or one of the things that we need to do, is to work to burn and overcome all our karma in order to reach the goal and to be free and merge with God. But all the true masters, including Jesus Christ, taught that if you love, if you love God, if you develop devotion, if you are carrying in your heart the presence of God all the time, and if you work and serve and do everything with God, that is more important than following every single little rule. And actually, they say, and it says in the Bhagavad Gita too, that if you love God, even if you break the rules, God will make it right for you. And this is very reassuring because we know that there's a lot of things that we should be doing and we are not necessarily able to do yet, but there's one thing that we can always do and that is love God, cultivating that relationship with God uh, every day in everything that we do. And uh, one of the one of the ways to cultivate that love is, like Swami says at the end of the reading, is to cultivate that attunement with the great masters. And uh, attunement with uh, the guru is important because we can draw the guru's qualities in our in ourselves by by thinking of him, by uh, checking in with him about what, we, what we're doing and, um, and just carrying his presence in our hearts. Um, Yogananda's foremost, foremost disciple was Rajasri Janakananda. He was a self-realized master by the end of his life and he was also um, a self-made millionaire. And uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful story that maybe many of you might not have heard. Um, there's one, there's a guy who lives in the Ananda Sacramento community who is actually a direct disciple of Yogananda. He's in his 80s and he met and took initiation from Yogananda himself. His name is, is Gordon, I can't remember his last name. But anyway, he told us this very beautiful story that he was present at. So Master had just finished giving Sunday service and people were lining up to go and greet him and take his blessing. And next to Yogananda was standing uh, Raju Sijanakananda, this very advanced disciple. Master always often wanted him to stand next to him. And so people were coming to the master and he was blessing every single one. And at some point this woman came and, and when she, she was in front of Yogananda, she started crying and she said, um, I am very poor, I have two or three children to raise. My husband left and left us alone and I have no money. I, I, I don't know what to do. Please pray for me. And Gordon says that uh, Yogananda just looked over to Rajasi, just like this. And Rajasi didn't say anything. He just stick, stuck, stuck a hand in his pocket and pulled out a roll of uh, bills and started counting them. And went like this, one, like this. And at some point, Yog Yogananda wasn't even looking what he was doing. And Yogananda went. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he stopped, and Rajashi gave these bills to Yogananda. He put them in his pocket. And then Yogananda blessed the woman, and then put the hand in his pocket, pulled out his uh, bills, and gave them to the woman, and she left. And what's fascinating to me about this story is Rajasi attunement. 
he totally got what Master wanted him to do. I mean, it was just like, just a look, and he was pulling out bills <laughs> from his pocket. It's, it's very sweet, and, and such incredible attunement. And just without questioning, you know, perfectly fine with what the Master was asking of him. And so that kind of attunement, and Yogananda once was asked, why is Rajasi Janakananda so advanced spiritually? And the only thing he said, he didn't say, oh, he meditates a lot, he does service, and this, no. All he said is, he knows how to listen. So, to know how to listen to the inner guidance from the guru, that is the way and the truth and the life. That right there is what we have to follow. If we are in tune with that, if we cultivate the relationship with that every single day, that is what will bring us home. So how do we ascend? This is the topic, uh, the divine ascension. Um, there are, um, you know, things that we know that we do every day. Uh, there's meditation, attunement, and service. But one thing that is very important to keep in mind that even if you live in an ashram, even if you live in the most sacred place in the world, it's, it, it's possible to, uh, to fail to do. And that is to, to cultivate that desire to know God, that desire in our heart. Every single, every one of us, has that responsibility to cultivate devotion. If we go through uh, our the motions, you know, like we get up in the morning, what do we do? Of course, we energize and then we sit down and meditate. And that's all good. But if we do it mechanically without that devotion in our hearts, that's not going to take us very far. And devotion is something that has to be cultivated. It doesn't come automatically. We have to every moment of our day think about what we're there to do and remember that God is there that Master is guiding us and to consciously call on their presence they don't impose on us um, Yogananda uh, said several times that uh, God has an inferiority com complex because he said because he assumes that nobody wants him. And that is why he is so he is silent. That is why he hides in creation and lets us believe that what we see out there is all there is to it. He lets us um, be deluded by the so-called reality of our little problems and pettiness like Bhagavati was reading about, uh, you know, what was it? Um, no, that was yesterday. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. <laughs> but the little things that, you know, we get caught up on. And, and God lets us believe that that's all true because he wants to be sure that once we give him our hearts, that is forever. That we don't uh, take it back. That we don't hold back anything. And so there is... Um, the whole secret of living in this world, and not just in this world, but in this universe, is to really decide and make a, a clear and serious and strong commitment about loving God. That is all there is to it. There is nothing else out there to do. There is nothing else out there that can give us satisfaction ever. And we know that. But we have every day to renew this commitment by uh, loving God more, by doing anything that it takes to reawaken and deepen this love for God in us and to share it with others. This is what we're here to do. There is nothing else that people need. People don't need sermons. 
Yes, they can be inspiring, but that's not what they need. They need love. They need devotion. They need God's love because that's what we all need. There is nothing else that we need. If we love God enough and we show it to Him and prove to Him that all we want is Him, He will come. And when His silence is broken once, it's broken forever. We will never, ever be alone again. And so, isn't that something worth working for? What are we waiting for? It's, it's really, that's the whole secret. It's right there. It's nothing else. Nothing else. Um, I want to... Um, I want to read to you a very sweet story, and I hope I'll be able to read it without crashing now before the end. <clears throat> and I, I'm going to read a little slow because I'm actually translating from Italian. I just found it this morning. A, a friend of mine posted it on Facebook, and it was so beautiful. I just, I just had to share it with you. So <clears throat> the title is The Three Gifts of the Holy Night. The shepherds had already left, and it was almost dawn outside the little hut where he was born. The Christ child lifted his head, and next to the door, he saw a little boy who looked shy and scared. Come closer, said uh, the Christ child. Why are you frightened? Because I didn't bring, I didn't bring you anything answered the boy. And yet, I would really like to receive something from you, said the, the child in the manger. <clears throat> the boy started to be worried. But I don't have anything. I don't own anything. If I had anything, <clears throat> excuse me, I would give it to you. He started to search his pockets uh, of his uh, worn worn out pins. All that I have is a blade of an old knife that I found. It's yours. No, said the child. Keep it. I want something from you that is very different. I want three things. Which ones? asked the boy. Give me the last drawings that you made. The boy blushed, embarrassed. And he leaned over and whispered in, in the Christ child's ear so that Mary and Joseph couldn't hear him. But that drawing, it was so ugly that nobody wanted to even look at it. This is why I want that drawing, said the child in the manger. Always give, give me everything that others... I'm sorry that others don't appreciate in you or what they think you lack. Also, the Christ child continued, I want your plate, but I broke it this morning. The, the, the boy said, this is why I'm asking it of you, said the Christ child. Always offer to me everything that is broken in your life, and I will fix it. And as last gift, said the Christ child, give me the answer that you gave to your parents when they asked explanation about the broken plate. In that moment, the boy became very sad and whispered, I told them that I pushed the plate off the table by mistake, but it was a lie. Actually, I threw it on the floor to the floor because I was angry. This is what I wanted to know, said the Christ child. Always offer to me everything that is not working in your life. The lies, the excuses, your cowardice, and your cruelty. I will take them away. You don't need them. I will make you happy. And I will never stop to forgive every your mistake. 
from today on, you can come and visit me every day. And so, this last part is very important. From today on, you can visit every day. When we give God everything we have without holding anything back, He breaks His silence and becomes a regular guest in our consciousness. We will always feel His presence all the time. We will know without, beyond any doubt that we are one with Him, that He loves Him, that we're, we're His own. When God breaks the silence, the job is done. Let's get the job done in this lifetime. Um, as Yogananda said many times, God doesn't mind your mistakes. He minds your indifference. So, this is um, our Christmas wish for all of us, that we may break that silence once and for all and be forever God's. So many.